Union uh, with the uh, with these uh, 18. Verse number 21 is our beginning verse. Let's stand together uh, as we read this together. It says, "Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof." And let's pray, Father. We are thankful for uh, each one here tonight. We're thankful for. Uh, the opportunity to study your word i pray that it would speak to our hearts that it would give us what we need and uh, lord the recharge that we need here uh in in this week and uh, lord may you be blessed maybe you be honored and lifted up by all that we say and do tonight we pray in jesus name amen thank you may be seated so wisdom is worthless if it only fills the head with knowledge there are people they know lots and lots and lots of things but what they don't know is how to do lots and lots and lots of things um and, and I, I can throw myself into that there are a lot of things i know about but to actually go and do it um you know i i know the theory of it but to actually put it into practice no not so much i'm thinking about the, for example drywalling uh, I've, I've watched that done. I've had it explained to me by contractors and so on when I, when I worked for the lumber company. But to actually do drywalling is a different story altogether. Uh, the few times that I have made attempts, I was very sorry that I tried. I mean, I know what I'm going for. I just can't get these hands to do what, what I know needs to be done. And, and so wisdom is that way as well. If all it is is something in the head that we understand the theory of it, but we never actually put it into practice, uh, then that wisdom really is worthless at that point. For example, as we have here in our notes, many people know about Jesus. They know the fact that he came, the fact that he died on the cross. They understand that, but they've never been moved from a head knowledge of those facts to a heart knowledge of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, where they actually accept that or receive that for themselves. And so there, there are good many who have, they have the understanding, they have the knowledge, they just have never put it into practice and so for those people that's worthless to know what is right and to deny that or to turn away from that peter talks about that uh in fact um, uh, paul talks about that in the book of hebrews as well those who they've come so close and they, they see and recognize what it is that the spirit is leading them to and they recognize what christ did for them and then they turn away from that that they have that wisdom they have the knowledge but they've never put it into use uh, for themselves and so uh, e even though they may know the answer to their sin problem they may know the answer to their uh, eternal dilemma yet they never actually put that into practice what is sad uh, I, I think is to consider the multitudes that will actually stand at the great white throne judgment knowing who jesus is knowing what he did to save them and knowing that they never accepted him for themselves uh, jesus talks about that in matthew 7 in verse 21 um, he, he talks uh, he, he says not everyone that saith unto me lord lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven and goes on to explain that but there are people who, oh, oh lord we knew who you were oh lord we serve you lord we did this and we did that but while they may have had the head now looking at this that's an important thing to remember uh, that this is uh, this is supposed to be wisdom that is acted upon hebrews 4 verse number 6 in talking about these people who have the head knowledge but not the heart knowledge of Christ. It says here, uh, Hebrews 4 and verse number 6, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So it's not that they didn't know. It's not that they didn't understand. They just didn't believe it. They never received it for themselves. So, uh, so we see that principle laid out in Scripture for us in their lives. And we can find these actions to be both just and proper. And we find them in. Uh, Lord willing, tonight we'll finish these first three verses. 
And you say, oh, three verses, that won't take long. I, I mean, you've all been around long enough to know better than that uh, at this point. But um, we see the introduction of wisdom in verses 1 through 3. And verse 1 gives us two traits that are necessary for the introduction of wisdom. There are two traits necessary. So as, as we're thinking about wisdom, not just knowing it, but applying it, there are two things that you need in your life. First, let's read this in verse 1. Through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. So the first trait that is necessary is the desire. Some people, they, you know, they have the idea, well, I want to go to heaven, but I'm not really interested in anything about God. I'm not really interested in anything with, with church. I'm not really interested in anything with the Bible. I just, I just want to go to heaven. So they look at salvation really as a get-out-of-hell-free card, as a fire escape. And, and that's how they look at it. And, and they have no concept of what salvation is all about, which is a total change in our life because we have a relationship with God. And, uh, and they have no concept of that. So they have no desire because all they're concerned about is I don't want to go to hell. They're not concerned about, well, what does God want of my life? What pleases God? They're, they're not interested in that at all. So desire is the first trait that is necessary. Desire is defined as an, an emotion, an emotion or excitement of the mind directed to the attainment or possession of an object from which pleasure, sensual, intellectual, or spiritual is expected. A passion excited by the love of an object or uneasiness at the want of it and directed to its attainment or possession. So uh, we have the idea, it is, it's, it's wisdom then needs to be the object for which we are longing. That has to be the thing. There has to be a desire. We talked about this in chapter 17 and in verse 6 we saw that the fool has no desire for wisdom. Proverbs 17, 6 says children's, um, mm, uh, no, um, Verse 16, 17, 16. Yeah, that didn't look right at all. Uh, verse 16, uh, wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he has no heart to it? He has no heart. He has no desire. He may want, as it were, he may want the diploma to hang up on the wall. To say, oh look, I know all these things. But he doesn't have any desire to know those things so that he can do them. Um, and, and so on the other side of that, the student is filled with a longing, a desire for wisdom. And that longing of godly or for godly wisdom is going to inevitably lead to a longing for uh, three things. Not one of three things, but all three things. First of all, there's going to be a longing for the word of God because that is where we find wisdom incorporated. We find it in the Word of God. In uh, Psalm 19, in verse number 10, uh, it says, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. And if you go back into verses 7 and 8, it talks about the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, verse 8, the statutes of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord. So it all has to do with the Word of God. More to be desired are they than gold. Well, let me ask you, how is your desire? Which is more important, the Word of God or a paycheck? Which is more important? Now, I understand. I'm not saying, hey, look, you ought to starve to death and spend all your time in the Bible. I understand we all have to work to survive and we all have things we have to do. I'm not talking about that. And of course, it'd be a poor testimony and it would be a lack of godly wisdom just to sit back and say, oh, I'm studying my Bible and not work. That would be contrary to godly wisdom. But I'm, I'm just saying, which is more important? Because the desire is going to be for the word of God more than more to be desired are they than gold. Uh, not only the word of God, but also 
the house of God. Back in uh, Psalm 27. Psalm 27. In verse number 4. Tells us one thing if I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So there will be a longing, a desire for the house of God. I think that's pretty obvious. So if, if you have a desire for godly wisdom, you're going to want God's word. If you have a desire for godly wisdom, you're going to want to be in God's house. Thirdly, uh, over in Isaiah 26 and verse number 9 if there is a desire for godly wisdom, there's going to be a desire for the person of God. In Isaiah 26 and verse number 9, it says, With my soul I have desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So there is a desire for the person of God. So it's, it, it's more than just Gaining the facts, gaining the knowledge of what wisdom is. It's understanding who it is that gave that wisdom and that knowledge. And obviously putting those things into practice. So desire is the first trait that is necessary for the introduction of wisdom. The second thing, uh, looking at this in Proverbs 18 and verse 1, Through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. So the second trait that is necessary to introduce wisdom is separation. So desire and separation. Separation is the state of being separate, disunion, or disconnection. Now, we should all understand this because we all practice separation of one kind or another. For example, when I go home and I, I shut the door of my house or shut the door of my bedroom, I'm actually separating myself from my children. I'm saying, stay away. Don't bother me. Uh, that's not necessarily what I'm saying because sometimes I actually say that. Uh, but no, in, in, in shutting the door to my bedroom, I am making a separation from them. It doesn't mean that I think they're bad. It doesn't mean I don't love them and don't care about them. It means that being with my wife is the more important thing, right? So, and, and, and we all have, um, like I said, separation. So when you go to work, and I'm, I'm not even talking about if you enjoy your job. So if you don't like your job, you know, you can still understand what I'm saying. When you go to work, and however you do that, whether you clock in or however that, that is, what you're doing is you are separating yourself from any other kind of employment. You're causing the separation because you can't work at four different jobs at the same time and get paid for them all. At least I haven't heard about that. And you know, maybe you know a secret I don't, you can let me in on that later. But there has to be a separation. If we're going to uh, introduce wisdom into our lives, we have to desire it. But there also has to be a separation from lack of wisdom or foolishness. See, to enjoy wisdom, there has to be a disunion or a disconnection from folly. You can't remain in the same silly attitude or silly way of thinking or silly way of acting and say, oh, I, I have wisdom. Not really, because there's no separation there between you and the folly that you know you shouldn't be involved in because you do have the head knowledge of wisdom. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17, we read a very familiar verse. It says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, in, in the context, he's talking about uh, actually a lot of different things. Uh, but he talks about, in verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what uh, communion hath light with darkness and he goes on with that same sort of uh, rhetorical type question 
So what is, what, what is it between the, the righteous and the unrighteous? What sort of union should there be? And Paul says, no, there should be a disconnection. There should be a lack. There should be a separation. Because if it is wise to follow God, then there has to be in turn a separation from those who don't. If it's wise for us to pattern our lives after God and after his wisdom, then there must be a separation from the paths that are unwise and that do not follow after the paths of wisdom. So there has to be a separation. Uh, and and uh, so let's, uh, let's see what else. Uh, there, there's obviously a need to disconnect from the noise, from the distraction the business of life uh, and from the world as a whole uh, in order to focus our attention on that which is most important because uh, you know if you're working i don't know how you are if i if i'm really into my work my wife comes up she talks to me yes 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 i have no idea what she just said she walks off later she says why didn't you i never heard anything like that i, I didn't you know it was sort of like on the peanuts, you know, the teacher, wah, wah, wah. And, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that to put her down at all. And I'm, I'm not saying that at all. It's that I'm so focused on what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to accomplish at that moment, that everything else is, is just out of the picture. It's as if it doesn't even exist. And really, that's the way it needs to be. If we want to introduce godly wisdom in our life, there's got to be that desire, but there has to be that kind of separation that everything else is just totally ignored. It's as if it doesn't even exist to us. Um, I mean, in modern term that we use all the time, it's as if it's dead to us. You know, that, that's really uh, the way, and no, that's not what I'm saying about my wife. So you stop that. We'll discuss that more on the way home, I'm sure. <laughs> Matthew chapter 13 and verses 45 and 46 says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him, saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. So. I, I read the totally wrong verse. Let's read the right ones. Verses 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Do you, do you see what, what he's saying? This pearl of great price was so important, nothing else mattered. And so he was willing to give up everything he had to obtain that one thing. That is the kind of separation we need to have if we're going to enjoy wisdom, not just in our head, but in our life. There has to be separation. And there's, there's a benefit to that separation, and that is the seeking and intermeddling with all wisdom. You notice how it says that, all wisdom. Uh, so, you know, sometimes, we come into the Christian life like a blank sheet of paper. We don't know anything. We may think we know some things, but the reality is we don't. And as we grow, the Lord begins to, as it were, jot some things down and give us some things. And as we separate ourselves from all the noise, all the busyness of the world and of our own lives so that we can focus on uh, not just knowing, but living godly wisdom. God gives us wisdom that we never would have expected. He helps us and opens doors that we never would have expected at all. Look at verse number two here in uh, Proverbs 18. And we see true simpletons cannot begin to introduce wisdom. So we have the two traits that are necessary, but then we have a whole group of people that can't even get to that point. So verse 2 tells us, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. So the fool's desire, his delight, makes havoc of his choices. In other words, the things that he longs for, the things that he desires, 
The things that he delights in are the very things that are causing him problems. The very things. Oh, I just want, well, that's not good for you. You know, you have that with little kids. And, and you know, as Jacob grows up, you'll see that. You know, he'll want some things, and it's not that, you know, for example, uh, sweets and candy. There's nothing wrong with having sweets and candy in moderation. But do you know what children want? They don't want moderation. They're not interested in that. They want what they want, when they want it, and they want all of it. You know, give me more, give me more. Um, I, I don't want to say that children are like dogs, but because dogs a lot of times are that way. They'll eat until they make themselves sick and, and things like that. But children will do that. Uh, they will. Uh, and and, um, and, and it's, it's because at, at that point in their life, they're foolish. They haven't learned better. They haven't gained the wisdom to understand, I have to be moderate or abstain from some things uh, in, in order to go forward. So the fool's desire makes havoc of his own choices. We see that uh, inattentive desire for understanding in the fool because the fool places no importance on godly wisdom. No importance at all. Oh, uh, well, you know, I'm... For example, I'm going to sow my wild oats. Oh, fine and dandy. That's a fool who places no value or places no importance on godly wisdom. In uh, Proverbs 1 and verse 7, we read, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and, and uh, instruction. So they have n no care for it. It's not important to them. It's no big deal to them. Uh, <clears throat> You know, that's where you get the, the thing where you share with people what God says, and they say, well, uh, that's your truth. What are they saying? That's not important to me. Even though it's what God said in black and white. Well, and, and what's sad is when you have Christians, Christians have questions. Well, what about this? What about this? And you show them black and white. Here's what God says. Well, I, I, I don't think that's what that means. Well, what are they saying? They're saying it's really not important to me because I don't like what it says. So therefore, it's not important to me. Uh, it, it's a sad thing that they have an inattentive desire for understanding. And, uh, you know, you can, you can see this sort of thing play out in a church service. How important an individual finds godly wisdom. And so I can look around, standing here in the pulpit, I can see who's here, I can see you, I can see the whites of your eyes, if they're open. But I can also see when your eyes are not open. And, and I understand, sometimes you work hard all day, and, and you come in, and it's warm, and I, I understand that, because I've been there too. But I also understand when it's a pattern. And every time you come in, there, you know, there, you know. Okay, well, I wish they brought their pillow because they're going to go to sleep anyway. Uh, and and then you have some others that, uh, you know, they're passing notes back and forth. That's generally a sign that they're not paying attention to the message, and the message is not really that important to them. Uh, then you have those who uh, are checking the time. We used to have. Uh, someone some time ago uh, that uh, the, the clock essentially was on, on the wall over here back in the back and they would sit in the back sort of toward the back and uh, you know about halfway through my message they'd turn around make a big show turning their head to see what time it was everybody from where they sat back knew exactly what they were doing well what are they saying Godly wisdom is not important to me. Uh, you have people sitting, scrolling through their phone. I understand some people, they, they will use their phone for, in, in the place of a Bible. I understand that. And uh, personally, I prefer people using a Bible. But if they're going to do that, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make a, a big to-do over that. Um, but I also can tell when... They're just scrolling. You know, it's just, you know, they're just doing this. Every once in a while, they'll glance up, are you still talking? 
and then you know they go right back to scrolling you can tell that individual has no interest in godly wisdom whatsoever it's obvious you can see that uh, and and it really does it's as if they paste a, a sign on their forehead I am a fool and, and it's a sad thing it you know it doesn't it doesn't anger me I, I think probably when I was younger when I was first preaching it used to make me mad you people you need to straighten up it doesn't anger me so much anymore as it saddens me because I recognize the road that they're going down I've watched so many people go down that same road I've seen the heartache and I've seen the hardship that is ahead of them and it saddens me when people come in and 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 I think why did they even bother why did they come they have no interest whatsoever in being here um, and it's not going to be good for them in the long run. It's, it's just sad is what it is. Uh, but the fool also has sold himself to commit folly. Not only is it not important to understand and follow godly wisdom, but he sold himself. In other words, he is invested in chasing after and practicing folly in his life. And uh, it, it's, like I said, it's just a sad thing to watch. Because what's so sad about it is not just the fact that they're choosing to go that way, but the fact that they don't have to choose to go that way. They can choose to seek after and, and apply godly wisdom. They could, but they have invested themselves or sold themselves uh, to commit folly. But we see not only this inattentive desire to understanding, but there's also the irresistible desire for self-awareness. If that is not our culture today. Because you have people, you know, oh, I'm quitting my job. Why are you quitting your job? Oh, I've got to go find myself. And there's all sorts of silly things that we say to that. Well, I've got a mirror, you know, it'll save you some time and uh, you can find yourself. But, but people, people are sadly being serious when they say those things. They think that's what they're supposed to, I have to go find myself. Um, and our world is, is filled with those sorts of people, but that is really the sign of a fool. That's what this tells us. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Well, isn't that what finding yourself is? Is you know finding who I am, finding what I am all about, finding what my purpose is. It's all very self-centered, rather than being God-centered, which is what God intended for us to be. And so, what what they're doing in finding themselves. Uh, is they are showing a lack of understanding on their part. That they are devoid of wisdom. Uh, Proverbs 1 and verse 22 says, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners de delight in their scorning. And fools hate knowledge. They show that they have a lack of understanding. They also show that they have a lack of God's blessing. Now, they may have good things happening in their life because they're following some principles that God's laid out. For example, one, one principle that God lays out is if you work hard, you're going to get ahead. There are ungodly people who have worked very hard in their life and they have accumulated all sorts of material wealth. Well, that's a biblical principle. So it's not that, oh, God's blessing them uh, for being bad, not at all. They followed at least that particular principle that God has laid out. But when we're talking about God's blessing, those who uh, are, are really out to find themselves, they're lacking in God's blessing. They're totally missing that. We see this here in Psalm 1 and verse 1. Blessed is the man who walketh not after the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, if you, if you look at those, 
the ungodly, the sinners, the scornful, if you look at those, those are all people who are lacking in knowledge, right? They're lacking in godly knowledge, maybe worldly knowledge and wisdom they have, but godly wisdom they have none of. And those are the people who do not have or enjoy God's blessing. Now, remember when we're talking about blessing, especially, especially as he's talking about it here, when he says, blessed is the man, he's talking about happy is the man. You see, someone may work hard all their life and be just an ungodly sinner and in every other part of their life be unwise in, in, after a godly sort. But they're, they're a hard worker and so they accumulate wealth. They can still be devoid of God's blessing because most of those people, if you've ever spent any time with them, and I've, I've happened to known a few wealthy people in my life uh, and if you know them none of them are happy there's no joy in their life at all they may have momentary pleasure uh, due to you know getting something new material gain or or buying something or whatever so they may get a momentary thrill out of that but there is no joy there is no happiness in their life that is missing they do not have God's blessing because they've rejected, they have no interest in, uh, in understanding God's way, but rather it's all about me, me, me. It's I've got to find myself. I've got to please myself. I have to comfort myself and, and so on. So uh, they're showing a lack of God's blessing. And also they're showing a lack of spiritual maturity. As you see here in 1 Corinthians 14, in verse number 12, where it says, even so ye for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. You, you see uh, what, what Paul's saying there. Spiritual maturity is not about how you can be more. Spiritual maturity really is, is seen in how can I help others be more. And that, that's what that verse is teaching, how you can edify or build up others. It's not about finding yourself. It's not about building yourself up. It's about building up others, which, as we talked about in chapter 17, that's counterintuitive wisdom. That makes no sense to, to this world. And so those who are shunning that and rather pursuing uh, the me, me, me sort of uh, ideology, uh, they're showing a lack of spiritual maturity if, if they are uh, saved. And so then in uh, verse number three here, Proverbs 18, we see that uh, true simpletons bring in varying forms of folly. In verse three, we read, when the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt and with ignominy reproach. So there's different kinds of folly, different kinds of foolishness that can be brought in with these true simpletons who turn their back on, on allowing wisdom to enter into their lives. There's two things here. He talks about first contempt. When the wicked cometh, uh, then cometh also contempt. And that word means the act of despising, disdain. So despising has to do with essentially looking down your nose. You know, oh, I'm better than that, and I, I could do I could do a much better job than them. That sort of thinking, and sometimes, yeah, maybe we can do a better job than other people. I mean, sometimes we do have some talent, and other people are trying to do the job, and you look at them, and they don't know what they're doing. We were at a uh, we were at a church meeting. And uh, the boys may remember where this was. I, I, I can't remember where it was offhand. Um, no, I remember where it was now. So I'm not going to tell. Uh, but we were at this church meeting. And uh, the, I mean, there was, there was a lot of us there, 100, 150 of us, uh, you know, different pastors and so on from, from that area. And so they had, they had the mix board down at the front of the platform, down on the, which is kind of an odd place because it was... I mean, it was like if I stepped off over here, 
and we'd be kicking the mix board. It, I mean, it was right there. But this was a it was a big place, a lot bigger than where we are tonight. And uh, they had a young boy, what, 12, 13 years old, running the mix board. Now, I have run the sound system in churches since I was in my late teens. And I've done, anyway, when, when I was on deputation, we'd go into church, hey, you know about sound systems? Come back here and look at ours. And you look at it, it's all held together with duct tape and prayer. And, uh, and you look at it and say, there's not much I can do with that. Uh, I'll pray with you, I guess. Uh, that's all I can do. But anyway, so, I mean, and, and it's not that I know everything about sound systems, because I know that I don't. And, and I know some other people who know a lot more than I do. And I, on purpose, when I'm around them, I'll just sort of kick something out. Hey, what about? And I'll just throw that out. And two hours later, I haven't said anything else. But hopefully I've learned something from, from them because they, they know more than I do. But I knew more than that 12, 13 year old boy. And the sound system, it, it was one of two ways because there were several speakers. It was either you couldn't hear it or it was squealing. That was your choice. Mm -hmm. There was no happy medium of, hey, I can hear it real well and it's not hurting my ears and it's not in any of that. No, none of that sort of thing. And, and I just, I sat there and, and I thought, I, I, I know I can do better. I know I can do better. But the thing is, it wasn't my place. The pastor of the church didn't ask me to do that. Even though I know, well, I say I know, I, maybe I would have just gotten squeal or louder squeal if I had done it. But I felt like I knew more. But that wasn't my place. And so sometimes we can be guilty of looking down our nose at somebody else. Oh, he's terrible. I don't even know why the pastor had him run the sound system. He should have asked me because I could have run circles around him. Well, I could have run circles around him. But that's because I'm older. Um, and I would have just sat on him and then he wasn't going to run anywhere. And so, and of course, I'm just joking about all that. But the thing is, those who are unwise, the simpletons, they will bring in the sort of folly where they walk in and say, oh, what are you doing? I can do better than that. And, and you have this, you have this in kindergarten. I, I remember kindergarten. Do you, any of you remember when you first went to school and there were other kids that maybe they learned their alphabet before you did and they're really good to let you. In fact, they're standing at the school door when you come in the first day. Do you know your alphabet? Can you read your name? Can you write your name? I don't even know my name. Why don't you just leave me alone? And, 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 and so you have that sort of thing from there, even up to, I'll be honest, you have pastors, you get pastors together, and sometimes it will, oh, how many are you running? And if you tell them, I never tell people. I mean, we could be running 500 tonight. Nobody would know. I'm not going to tell them any different. I'm not going to tell them it's 525 tonight. Anyway, I, but I don't tell people because I've watched what happens. Oh, how many do you run? Oh, you run less than we do? Oh, oh you, you, you run 50? Oh, we run 55. And, and there's that disdain. That's folly. That's not somebody who's gained in wisdom. And certainly not showing spiritual maturity, trying to build up someone else. But there's that distinct. But there's also the other aspect of that as well. Again, in verse 3, when the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt, and with ignominy reproach. That word that I am stumbling over means uh, public disgrace, shame, reproach, dishonor, or infamy. Isn't that usually what happens with people who are so full of themselves and so proud? It would have been my luck had I gotten up to help that 12, 13 year old boy that I would have just blown up the whole mix board. It just had the whole thing blow up. I've had that happen before. I had a powered mixer, um, I think it's where I was pastoring uh, down south. We had a powered mixer and I didn't do anything different than I'd ever done except that it was that mixer's time. And I flipped the switch and boom. And 
and that was the last that mixer ever did for me. Uh, it just, it was gone. So, <laughs> that could have happened. That could have happened to me. Uh, something along those lines. And it would have been a public disgrace for me. And here I'm looking down my nose at a young man who's doing the very best he knows to do. And I'm saying, oh, I can do better than that. And when I get up, it just totally falls apart, as if it wasn't before, but it totally falls apart. Then, when that happens, then enters reproach, which means um, that which is the cause of shame or disgrace. So, in, in other words, you bring it on yourself. That's, that's really the idea. Yes, there's shame and there's infamy and there's disgrace, but you've caused it because of the folly. So, to introduce wisdom, we need desire and we need the separation. But on the flip side, you notice Solomon spends a lot more time on the flip side of that, of those who are not willing to introduce wisdom. You know, there's two reasons why that can be the case. Obviously, the Holy Spirit uh, in, in inspired or gave Solomon the words to write. So that's without saying. I'm, I'm not trying to say anything different than that. But Solomon may have spent more time dealing with the flip side because he knew his son to whom he was writing. But also because God knows all of us. And God knows that we are far more likely to chase after folly than we are to actually have a desire and actually separate so that we can enjoy godly wisdom in action in our lives rather than just, well, I know all these things. So we need to take these things to heart.